what I'd like to talk about is one, some predictions about uh, the, result, the outcome of the summit, um, two, our challenges ahead after the summit, and then three, uh, what that means for the peace movement for tomorrow and uh, onward. So the summit prediction, obviously I have no crystal ball, um, and everything I say today might be moot uh, by tomorrow, uh, but I am by training an acupuncturist, so I think <laughs> I'm pretty good at reading signs and symptoms. Um, so uh, based on all indications, I suspect that the summit will produce an agreement on two very important things. One is replacing the 1953 armistice with a peace agreement, and two, uh, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. So let's talk about each of those things. So on the peace agreement, last week, um, if you saw the press conference uh, right after Trump's summit with Prime Minister Abe, he was asked on the possibility of a peace agreement with North Korea, and Trump's answer was, quote, we could absolutely sign an agreement. We are talking about it. It could happen. Um, that was not a very good imitation of Trump. Um, <laughs> so I think we should not be surprised if, when the two leaders meet in Sing Singapore, that they actually do declare an end to the Korean War and sign a peace treaty. Um, or, at the very least, uh, at the very least, pledge to move on it this year uh, if they choose to include South Korea in the process. There has been speculation that Trump may send whatever deal is produced through the summit to Congress for ratification as a treaty. Um, I think it's unclear if this is really the intention of the administration. No past nuclear deal with North Korea had been sent to Congress for ratification for obvious reasons. Um, for example, the Geneva Agreement in 1994 was purposefully called an agreed framework, uh, not a treaty, uh, because that requires two-thirds majority approval by the Senate. Um, Clinton didn't send it to the Senate because he knew there would be opposition and that um, he, he wouldn't get the votes. I think the current moment is uh, probably no different. Um, sending to Senate for treaty ratification is highly risky. It opens the door, obviously, for groups that have an interest in undermining the deal. Um, I think it was Pompeo that first publicly hinted at the possibility of Senate approval, but then at his most recent press conference um, on Friday, that was right after the Trump-Abe summit, he was asked specifically that question about treaty ratification, and he said, um, he left it kind of vague. He said they will send something to Congress to ensure that whatever deal they make is implemented even after a change in administration, but he didn't specifically use the word treaty. So at any rate, um, whatever the administration sends to Congress after the summit, I think our job tomorrow is to make sure that members of the Foreign Relations Committee uh, know that there is broad grassroots uh, support for finally ending the seven-decade-old Korean War and moving towards establishing normal relations between the two countries. On the question of denuclearization, um, I think they will agree on the language of complete denuclearization for a nuclear-free Korean peninsula. This is the language they use in the Panmunjom Declaration. Um, you know, the media has made a big deal about the vagueness of the term denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. What does that mean? But um, we should note that this language is what the U.S. had agreed to in every past nuclear agreement it signed with North Korea. So the 1992 Joint Declaration of South and North Korea on the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, the 1994 Agreed Framework, the 2005 Joint Statement that came out of the six-party talks, they all use the same language, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. It means removing all things that pose a nuclear threat to the peninsula. So that doesn't just include North Korea's nukes. Um, so for example, in the 2005 Joint Statement, North Korea, quote, committed to abandoning all nuclear weapons and existing nuclear programs. And the United States, quote, affirmed it has no nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula, has no intention to attack or invade the DPRK with nuclear or conventional weapons. South Korea, quote, reaffirmed its commitment not to receive or deploy nuclear weapons in accordance with the 1992 Joint Declaration of the Denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula while affirming there exist no nuclear weapons within this territory. So I think tomorrow's summit will produce an agreement on a step-by-step -step 
phased approach to denuclearization, whereby the US and North Korea will take mutual steps to eliminate their nuclear weapons in and around the Korean Peninsula and move towards normalization. So for example, it could start with a freeze for freeze, right? So North Korea would say, we will stop our nuclear missile tests and the US should stop nuclear strike exercises. The details, obviously, I don't know, but it could be a, something like that. How far the agreement goes in terms of complete denuclearization, I think depends partially on how far the US is willing to go in drawing down its nuclear assets in the region. Um, Trump, at the press conference with Abe, said this will be a first of series of meetings ahead. And he said, quote, this is really the beginning. It's the easy part, and the hard part remains. So I think this signals that there will be a long road ahead. Um, so for it to be a successful uh, series of meetings in achieving genuine peace, I think this will require bipartisan support in Washington. Um, challenges ahead. We know that there are many challenges ahead. Um, number one, obviously, military industrial complex interests in Washington. Um, Josh Rogan wrote an interesting piece in the Washington Post recently. Um, he talked about the last time there was serious discussion in Washington about drawing down uh, U.S. troops in Korea. This was during the, uh, the Carter administration. Um, and he described how Carter received tremendous pressure from the Pentagon, the CIA, and then finally he gave in. And he quoted a Pentagon official during that time speaking on the Pentagon's campaign to obstruct Carter's plan of withdrawing troops from Korea. And he said, quote, we began a rear guard action, delay it, water it down, mitigate the decision as much as possible. We should assume that Trump will face the same kind of pressure. Um, for so long, we know that the narrative about Korea has been, South Korea is our ally. We saved them from the evil communists. North Korea is a totalitarian government, a threat to global peace. So the US needs to be there to protect the South from the North, right? We know this, we hear this all the time. And this narrative has been profitable for certain very powerful interests. South Korea, we know, is a top purchaser of US weapons. The US is building a trilateral missile defense system uh, with South Korea and Japan. The North Korea threat is always the primary justification. So there are powerful interests that have a great stake in maintaining the same narrative. And um, I think the attempts to undermine uh, a peace process in Korea will be bipartisan. So already we saw, um, I think it was um, a Republican senator from Alaska added an amendment to the to next year's Defense Authorization Act. Um, and the aim of it was to prevent the troop reduction in South Korea. Um, so we already see this happening. So uh, that would be a great challenge for us. The second thing is partisan politics, right? So um, the timing of the summit falls right before the midterm elections. So the Democrats, who should be our natural allies on this issue and should be applauding the fact that they are sitting down for direct talks, they've been either very silent on the issue or actually kind of obstructionist, right? Um, mainly, you know, I mean, it's understandable. They don't want to appear, they don't want to do anything that looks like they're legitimizing Trump in any way, right? Um, so Chuck Schumer's letter was already mentioned. Um, it's a, as a case in point, uh, the letter insisted on anytime, anywhere inspections of North Korea's nuclear facilities. Um, obviously, this is an impossible threshold because no country would ever allow an enemy country to come in and inspect your military bases anytime. Um, you know, we could ask the same question of the U.S. Would the U.S. Uh, accept a reciprocal demand from North Korea demanding an inspection of its military bases in the South, right? Because the U.S. did have hundreds of tactical nuclear weapons in the South from 1958 to 1991. And we just accept that the U.S. no longer has those weapons because it says so, right? But um, there has never been a verifiable, there's never been uh, inspections to verify. Um, and certainly it's not irreversible, right? So I think, um, so this brings us to our task. Um, I think our job as the peace movement starting tomorrow 
uh, is to move potential allies in Congress and figure out how do we create a way for the Democrats in Congress to take a principled position on this issue in support of the peace talks in the historic interest of peace, not uh, acting in partisan interest only, uh, but doing so without appearing like they are supporting or legitimizing the Trump administration, right? That is a tricky task, but I think at this, as a peace movement, this is what we need to figure out. I think we should start by pointing to the excellent letter spearheaded by Congressman Rokana um, as an example of a firm and principled position. It opposes military action uh, and supports a phased process of denuclearization and normalization. Um, it is a very good letter. I think we should encourage all members of Congress to support this. I think we, we can also point to the unity statement that is in your packet uh, as evidence that there is broad support for this peace process. Uh, this was a letter that was spearheaded by 40 plus Korean American organizations around the country. I cannot remember an example of an issue that brought so many groups together uh, in recent history. Um, and then it was endorsed by 100 plus organizations across the country, peace and anti-war and other progressive organizations. So I think we should point to this and say, look, there is broad uh, community support for this peace process. Uh, and that's all for my presentation. Thank you.